of you made that choice and probably will not be near as sore later in the day as those who chose to do that. And so we are glad that you are here. If you will take your Bibles, we began a new series last Sunday uh, looking at some of the parables of Jesus. Uh, we're going to be in the book of Luke 16 today, and, and really uh, Jesus, the, the, the wisest man, the best man, the, the man who was the best teacher who wanted to share the truth of the gospel and to share the truth of God's love and his justice, uh, to make it available to all of us, chose to do this many times through these stories, through these parables. And so I want us to look today at really what is considered one of the, I don't know, most confusing of the parables. Uh, I mean, it's, it's an interesting story, but you kind of have to sometimes try to ask, what is Jesus really meaning as he shares all of this? And so as we go through this, we need to ask, what does Jesus want us to know? What does Jesus want us to to learn how does Jesus want us to respond so with that in mind as we open Luke the, uh, the 16th chapter let's read together either you have hard copy notes or it's in your PowerPoint or you can use a Bible there in front of you uh, we, we find these words beginning in the first verse Jesus told his disciples there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions so he called him in and he asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job, people will welcome me into their house. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quick and make it 150. Then he said to the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. But the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself. So when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. We'll stop there. I think the confusion can stop. You look at this and you're trying, what exactly is the story? What is the point? We, we look at the Good Samaritan, that, that's rather obvious. Last week we looked at the, the, the parable of the sower, he even explains that one for us. Uh, but, but here's a story of a man who is, he's a manager and we're not sure whether it's, it's gross incompetence or it's just actual outright embezzlement, but, but he's been accused of wasting uh, the resources, and so the landlord, who is in the agricultural business, calls in his manager, and he says, you know, there's a lot of information that's coming my way, and none of it is really good. And as Jesus tells this story, the manager kind of sits there. I, I envision my children at this point, okay, when I call them in to talk to them, and I start off with, do you have something you want to tell me? Okay. Now, they have no idea what I know. They don't want to confess to things that are not the point of the conversation. And so they just sit there. Okay. Uh, any other parents ever have kids that did that? Yeah, okay. There's a, there's a few. Um, so it's amazing. He says, I'm hearing all of this information and none of it is good. Uh, and so what, what, do you, what do you think about all of this? And I think the guy just kind of sits there. I mean, he, he's not really sure what he should respond. And so uh, he says, uh, the, the owner finally just says to him, you know what, uh, I, I don't want you, you're fired, but I want a full accounting of where we are in our finances before you leave. So the manager knows 
that he's got to do something quickly. I mean, he's, got, he's, he's in deep trouble and he's got this small window, okay? Uh, this small window of opportunity when word has not yet gotten out that he's been fired and yet he's still kind of got his job. I mean, he's still got to get this final uh, accounting put together. And, and so, uh, so he, he's trying to figure out all this and, and the manager is kind of forced into reality okay he's forced into this reality and his reality is that he is being fired okay verse three if you look at that verse three talks about this he said you know the manager knows that word will eventually get around and and he's saying you know what i i, I want to do something in this window of opportunity where when I'm fired, I'll have some place to go. I may need some place to live. I may need a good reference. I need people thinking well of me. And I don't have a very long period of time to do this because as I look at my life, I really am not... I'm not strong enough to go out and dig ditches. I'm, in too, I'm too embarrassed to at, go out and beg. And so, so what, what is going to be my plan? Well, we look at verse 4, and the implications is that the idea comes to this man, and he says, I know what I'll do. And Jesus tells the story that he doesn't let us kind of in on. We have to kind of figure it out as we go along. But the key to this story is that at this point, nobody knows, okay? The word has not gotten around the community that he's, he's been fired. And so he begins to try to figure out what he can do. So he starts calling in his master's debtors, okay? And he does it one at a time. He doesn't, he doesn't want uh, uh, the word to get out and, and have a group meeting because if you notice, uh, the first guy got a better deal than the second guy, um, you know, the first guy got a 50% discount. The, the second guy only got a 20% discount. But, but it, so he wants the freedom to kind of deal with each one of these people um, uh, on his own. And, and I think he wants to do this because I'm going to do these people a favor. And in, in return, I'm hoping that they will do me a favor in return. Okay, that they'll offer me a job, that they will, that they will be friends or kind to me. And, and so, so he, he brings in the first one, and it, according to the story, he doesn't, you know, say, sir, how are you? How are your family? He sits down, and, and he just quickly says, okay, take the bill, sit down quickly. Now, why quickly? I think this man is acting fast. I mean, in the next few minutes, he's going to save this man probably thousands of dollars. And, and so he does that, and he's moving quickly, and he does it with the next one, and he does it with the next one. And, and, and this amazing thing, it begins to kind of come together, and the master finds out, and, and the master, okay, the owner, now if it's me, I'm, I'm just being really honest with you, if it's me, I'm really ticked, okay? Now, most of you probably would have responded the way the owner did, but, but, but no, it wouldn't have been my response. But, but the owner kind of comes in, and he then begins to commend this guy. I mean, if, if you really kind of look at it, he, he commends him because he acted shrewdly. Now, what's going on? Is Jesus, is Jesus advocating dishonest business practices uh, no he's really not so what does Jesus mean what is he saying to us in this parable and so I want to just kind of start by giving you um, uh, four key statements that we'll just kind of use as the the foundation for for where we go from here but the four key statements are this the first one is the, the, the shrewd manager says, you know what, I have a problem. Okay, I have a problem. He, he was forced into that reality quickly. The second thing is, I will take responsibility. Okay, there was no way to pass it off on to anyone else. The third is, I'm going to form a realistic plan. 
And the fourth is, I will take action. Jesus is commenting on this aspect of the story, not the ethics of it, not the honesty, dishonesty. He's talking about the plan. He's, he's talking about how the man came together. And so I want us to think about these four key statements as we look at some different areas of our lives. I mean, re- reality is tough. Have you, have you ever had times in your life where where things just seem to be so difficult you didn't even want to get out of bed okay you just kind of want to pull the covers up and turn over and and you you you, you may want to put on your headphones or or you may just you know want to just ignore life and pretend as if life was okay and Jesus is saying folks Our problems don't go away. They don't go away. And you and I know that this is true. But there are times when we don't really want to take responsibility for the problem. Whether we created it or not, it's there. And many times we don't have a plan on what we're going to deal with this. And so we just kind of want to put it off. And so as we then come, okay, to the last half of verse 8, Jesus makes it through the story. The master commended uh, the dishonest manager because of he act, uh, how the way he acted. Look at the last part of verse 8. It says, for the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. This guy was not an honest character. And he was only dealing with stuff, okay? Wheat, oil, he, he, he was only dealing with that. But if this guy who has no character can be resolute and creative and bold, how much more should we as the people of God face reality with courage and determination? Why, why, why should we do that? I, in a few months, will have been your pastor for 10 years. And so as a result of that, I've just, I've been thinking about what, what all this means. What is this thing that we do every Sunday morning? And, and, and why do we do that? And, and as I thought about that, I, 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 just coming through Easter and, and, the, and the crucifixion and all that, that that represents and what followed after the crucifixion, that Jesus took his message and he, he gave it to the church. And he said, church, I want you to begin to use my message. I thought about that. And I, I began to, to think about a story of, of, a, of a boy that I, I saw on the news. Uh, he was about 10 years old and, and uh, he, had, he had been arrested because he was, he was beating up this, I think he was a seven-year-old, just beating him up and they said it was part of some kind of a gang initiation. And as I I thought about that kid, as I thought about the trajectory of his life, at 10 years of age, he's in a gang, he's beating kids up, unless something changes in his life. At, At 12, it could be knives, and at 14, it could be guns. I mean, this kid's in trouble unless something changes in his life. So I begin to think, what, well, what, what could change? Uh, is, is there, if we elect the right politician, is there a politician, if we put them into power, uh, that, that, that they could create a law that would, that would change the trajectory of this kid's life? And, 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 and I thought, you know, as, as, as great as our law system and our government is, we should never confuse use the power of the law with the power to change the human heart it can't do it so I, I begin to think is there some educational curriculum that could be created that's going to change this kid's life is there some business product some app something that's going to change the life of this kid and and I came up with nothing 
it's going to take someone, some Sunday school teacher, some youth worker, some, some children's worker who is willing to come alongside this kid and put their arm around him and say, you may not be loved at your home, but you are loved here because we have the love of Jesus we want to share with you. That is the hope that this kid has. Why do we do all of this? Why should we, with courage and determination, go out and try to begin to deal with things and to become the church that God wants us to be? Because, folks, I truly believe the church is at the vortex of human existence. We are in between the, the, the powers of, of spiritual uh, warfare and that we are here. We are at the center of it. That's what the church is. And we have that to share with the world. I think sometimes, though, we don't do that. We, we, we think about doing different things and we go, oh, I don't know. That, I'd be really uncomfortable with that. Folks, the Bible calls the church a hospital. If we're not having people with their woundedness come into the hospital, we become a hotel. Okay, we may look for hotels that have certain amenities and they've got nicer things than we do. But folks, we are called to be the church. It's us or lights out. And so that's why we are called to be the people and to do what Jesus wants. And it's not easy to do that. And Jesus has said, you know what, as you face the reality of this mission, it will not be easy. Because reality is hard. And sometimes those of us who follow Jesus, we, we, we want to back away from that. And we want to spiritualize some of these, these kind of things in our lives. In, in other words, we, we try to take language that sounds spiritual, but, but could be kind of just passing over it. And so I want us to, to think for a moment if we as people are going to truly become people that God can use to go out there and not to be a hotel, but to be a hospital where people who are hurting can come and can be accepted, then we have to deal with who we are. And, and, and to me, this is what this, this parable is dealing with because I, I want us to look at four areas of our lives. Where, where I think this parable can apply for us. And the first area is this, is, is the area of character. Or, or you might even sla put slash uh, personality issues. I mean, some, some people, some people even within the church, but let's just keep it kind of broad so we don't want to get anybody upset. Uh, listen, some people are negative. Have you ever known a negative person in your life? Don't don't look at them. I mean, please. Uh, but 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 I mean, if you think about it, people that are complaining, people that are always pointing out other people's faults. I mean, the, uh, there are other kinds of people that are chronic victims. I am always the victim of everything that happens. I think that sometimes we 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 need to understand that that we are people that sometimes people don't run to, we can become people that people run from. And, and, and the hard reality about myself is that I need to ask myself, am I constantly negative? Am I, am I a, a person that cannot be trusted? Am I a person that, that people uh, look at me as, as being a liar or you can't keep a confidence? I mean, as we evaluate ourselves, what kind of person am I? Is it possible that you need to be honest about your character? I mean, we need to find someone as followers, as believers, that we can talk with about these kind of issues. I mean, maybe it's a, a, a close Christian friend. Maybe it's a, a small group leader. Sometimes it, it may be a pastor. Folks, if, if you really want to feel as if you are a part of this church, you're going to need to find some kind of small group to be a part of. You really will. Because, because 
when you come here and, and at the end of the day, there will be hundreds of people that will come and go throughout this building and, and chances of you grabbing one and that being the person you connect with may not, may not happen. I remember once when I was, was pastoring, I was up at a pastor's retreat up in, in the Colorado mountains and, and received word that one of the members of our church had, had, had fallen and had a stroke and um, was in the hospital. And so Danine and I jumped in the car and we drove down the mountain and went into that hospital. He was in ICU. His family was in the waiting room and I walked in and, and the wife looked up and she goes, well, pastor, we thought you were at pastor's retreat. And I said, yeah, I was. But as soon as I got word, I, I came and she came over and hugged me and she said, well, I really appreciate you coming, but we really don't need you. I mean, our small group is here. And I looked around, and all the members of that small group were there. Folks, that's how we become community. That's how we become what God wants us to be. How we become the family of God. I mean, we can share our truth and we can be accountable, but we, we need people that help us. We are not good Lone Ranger Christians. And so we need people that will be with us. And maybe what, whatever you're dealing with as far as a character issue or, or your personality, find someone. Maybe you even need private lessons. You're saying, okay, I'm willing to go to a, a Christian therapist. But we need to begin to to understand there are things in our lives that we need to address we need to maybe memorize scripture i placed one in in your in your notes it just simply says rejoice in the lord always again i say rejoice maybe you need to remember that and when you're feeling negative begin repeating that scripture saying it over and over and over again and so so as it relates with our character do I have a problem? Do I take responsibility? Am I forming a plan? Am I willing to take action? I think the second area of our life we need to look at is in relation or is in the area of our relationships. I mean, our relationships are the key to, to being healthy spiritually. I mean, there could be times when we're in a relationship that is not healthy but we really don't want to change that. Sometimes it, it may be a parental relationship. It may be a, a, a boyfriend, girlfriend, romantic kind of relationship. It could be relationships with, with, with co-workers or employees. But the, the Apostle Paul says to us in Ephesians 5, be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. I mean, there may be unresolved conflict in your life that you have. There could be a bitterness. And folks, we, we can ignore this, and probably we have been for a period of time, but, but we need to be honest. We need to form a plan. And, and I would dare say that most people have at least one relationship where something isn't right. That we need to work hard on, that we need to acknowledge, that we need to take responsibility for our portion of that, that we need to form a plan, and that we then need to take action. And I believe part of that plan needs to be that we consult and seek the direction of the Holy Spirit. God will help us, but, but I, I, want, I want us to make one thing really clear, okay? And I, I believe in restoration. I believe that we should be able to, 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 to go to people and, and, and have those times where, where relationships can be restored. But I do realize that restoration takes two people, Okay? I cannot guarantee you that restoration in the fact that the two come together. My, my term for it is those Hallmark movie moments. Okay? Um, 
my girls watch those all the time, and I go in, and I go, I figure out who the three characters are. It's either two guys and a girl, or two girls and a guy, and, and you know, one's going to end up being out, and the other two, are, you know, go through a problem, but at the end, they come together, and all is well with the world, and, and so, you know, I, I love, I love to, to, I love to be able to tell you that as you seek restoration, that you will have your hallmark movie moment, but I can't promise that. But I do believe that what, what does happen is that you are faithful to doing what God wants you to do as part of that relationship. And so I, I, I believe that we, we, grasp his, we grasp his guidance and his strength and we do what he says and then we can feel as if, God, I have done my part. I've done all I am responsible for. I think the third area of our life is in relation to our vocation. I think, I, I, I think sometimes we can get, you know, we can spiritualize things here. I had a friend once who, who needed a job, was aware of a job that he, he really wanted, but, but he said, you know what, I, I'm not going to do anything uh, to to pursue that job, okay? I'm not going to make any phone calls. I'm not going to send any resumes. I'm not going to contact any friends. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to do anything. And that way, when the job opens up, okay, then I will know it is of God. And I said, okay, so you're waiting for them, you know, to some point just kind of magically hear your name and type it into Google and find your phone number and, and, and then and call you. Because, folks, we need to kind of partner with God, okay? We need to be willing to knock on doors, which allows Him then to open doors. If we don't knock, they don't open. But not every open door is of God, okay? If you knock on a door and it opens, it doesn't mean it's God's will for you to walk through it. That's where you have to kind of stop and, okay, God, is this what you want? And the example um, that I have is, um, you know who that is, Jana. Uh, who's the guy that ran away, God said, go? Jonah, thank you. Just had one of those moments. Um, I can tell you the whole story. Just couldn't come up with his name. Um, but 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 God told Jonah, "I want you to go to Nineveh." And and so Jonah goes running down uh, to the harbor, and there's a ship that is there, which did not happen every day, and it was a ship going the other direction. And so he then says, well, this must be of God. I mean, there's not a ship ever here every day, and so I'm going down. It's just it's going in the opposite direction. Not every open door is of God. And so I think that as we do these things, God, God's will for us is to be discerning and wise as it relates to our vocation. And there will be times when we will see God at work. There will be some incredible moments when, when God opens doors that you never even knew existed before. When, when those happen and, and you see those miracles, then, then you're, you're grateful to Him. But be diligent. Do your work as unto the Lord. And so as it relates to our vocation, do you take responsibility? Do you form a plan? Are you willing to take action? The final, and I need to, I need to hurry here, but our final area is, is in relation to our finances. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful thing that God blesses us and allows us to be managers of what he blesses us with for a period of time. But sometimes we want to take possession, and these are my things. No. Whatever you have is a blessing from God. God gives you stuff, and, and you're able to then, you know, buy boats or, or buy cars, buy homes, whatever. But you know what? None of that goes with you. And so as we are stewards of what he blesses us with, 
We can't allow the stuff to control us. And, and if, this is, this is, if this is a problem where, where these things are so important to you that, you that you allow them to control your life, then the question is, are you willing to be honest? Are you willing to take responsibility? Are you willing to form a plan? Are you willing to begin to put it into action? Uh, a guy named Ken Bailey who, who writes uh, about parables was writing about this one, and, and he, he made an interesting point. He said, something happened between verse 7 and verse 8, okay? The owner finds out, okay, he's already fired the manager, um, and so the manager goes out, and he, he does all of this, what I would call underhanded kind of stuff, and the owner finds out, and he's, he's got two options now, okay? One option is that he can call all those debtors back and go, you know what, I did not approve those things. He did that without my permission. Uh, all those deals are off. I mean, he, he could have done that. But most of the time, okay, when there was a reason, and especially in this culture, when there was something good that happened, people threw a party. I mean, the, this culture loves to throw parties. And so chances are, if you had this huge indebtedness and it's just been uh, cut in half, you're throwing a huge party. And so as they're celebrating and, and having a great time, the owner sees this. Okay, so now he can walk into the party and go, no, 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 all, all that's off. Or... As he watches this celebration, as he watches all of this, he could just decide to let it go. He could be amazingly generous and just write it off. And the master, of course, he, you know, I mean, he's, a, he's a smart guy. So he, re, he reflects on these options and he, he then commends the, the manager on his shrewdness. And the manager, though, if you stop and think about it, the manager knew of the owner's character. And he knew that he was dealing with a generous and a gracious man. And the manager bet everything on the owner. This is how I think he will respond. I believe instead of taking the deals off the table, which then I become the laughing stock, I, you know, everybody hates me, I'm counting on this manager doing the right thing. And this manager did the generous thing. Now, Notice the manager didn't get rehired, okay? The owner wasn't that generous. He wasn't that gracious. I mean, Jesus was not commending his dishonesty. Jesus is saying, if this dishonest guy had the courage to face this problem head on, and it was simply over oil and wheat, but he relied so heavily on the generosity and the grace of the owner. Why would we as followers of Jesus, believers of God, not believe in the generosity and the grace of our Heavenly Father? We can trust Him, folks. And as we put trust in Him, we do what we feel like we should. I, I, I don't know, Jesus, I, I feel like you're wanting me to do this in my financial life. I, I feel like you're wanting me to do this in my, in my vocational life. I feel like you're wanting me to do this in my relational life. And I don't know, it's, it's, it's awful scary, I've never done that before, but I trust you. I, I trust your graciousness. I trust your love. I trust you that if you're leading me to do this, that it will be the right thing. So my question is, what do you need to do in some area of your life? What area of your life are you, you needing to acknowledge, yes, I have a problem? Yes, I take responsibility. 
Yes, I need to form a plan and I need to begin to put it into action. Bow your heads with me, if you will. Dear Jesus, we ask these questions truly desiring to hear from you. So God, speak to us. If there's a relational issue, God, speak to us about who that is and what you would have us do. If it deals with our finances, if it deals with our vocation, if it deals with our character, God, speak to us because you are trustworthy. And so, God, I pray that we will be willing to put into action the things you call us to do. We ask these things by the power and the love of your name. Amen.